Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian. Historically, in radio communications, interference is a big problem, whether it's for Wi-Fi devices, cell phones, or even high-powered communication systems that the military uses. A small California company that's a spin-off from Stanford University, it's got 35 people and based in Sunnyvale, California, is Kumu Networks. Uh, the company has devised a new technology that could revolutionize communications as we know it, whether for cell phone communications, the Navy's high power radars, or even the communication systems on fifth generation combat aircraft. Joining us is Joel Brand, the vice president uh, for uh, program uh, for product management, I should say, at Kumu Networks. He's a Silicon Valley uh, veteran from, uh, if I recall correctly, Joel, from Byte Mobile and from uh, Ruckus. That's correct. Thank you, Vago. Uh, welcome. Uh, good, good, good to have you on. So talk to us a little bit about this technology, because for a lot of people, it's uh, a little bit complicated to understand. But you guys have basically cracked a code and you guys are making inroads in the market, even though you're a relatively small company, you're making a lot of progress. Talk to us at base about the challenge and about how your technology addresses and solves that problem. Sure. T traditionally, Systems have been either uh, frequency division duplex or time division duplex. Um, when, when we build uh, communication networks of any kind, for example, the uh, cellular phone that you're using is probably a, a frequency division duplex system, which means that the phone transmits on one frequency while the uh, tower is sending signals to the phone on a different frequency. Uh, Wi-Fi, for example, is a, is a system where um, multiple systems are taking turns which one is going to be transmitting at any given moment. That's time division. What we have done, we have succeeded to solve the problem of self-interference, interference that is right. generated locally, which is the source, that's the reason why systems are either FDD or TDD today. And the way we do that, we do that not very differently than um, than the noise cancelling headset that you wear on your head when you, uh, when you fly somewhere. The, the way these systems work is that they record the environment and they inject the noise in a 180 degree phase back into your ear so your brain thinks that it doesn't hear anything. And the, the, same, the same concept applies to, um, uh, to radios. When the radio transmits, we take the transmit noise and we invert it and we inject it back in a 180 degree phase into the receiver. So we see the receiver thinks that it doesn't um, hear anything. A, a good way to think about it is a, is a noise canceling headset that is attached between your mouth and your ear. When you speak, <laughs> you don't hear anything. That, that would be, uh, for, for a lot of people, maybe including me, that would be a great technology to have. Um, so talk to us about the scalability of this, because uh, it is a very, very clever solution to uh, a problem. And, and a you know, all, um, everybody in the business has used a whole variety of mechanical systems sometimes, sometimes electronic systems in order to mask it. The trick has been to scale it to work in uh, large high power applications, for example, or highly sensitive applications. So talk to us a little bit about the scalability of the technology. You know, what are the different types of applications where you guys can, can employ this that go beyond just a commercial uh, cellular product, uh, given that you guys are actually driving very, very hard to expand into the military marketplace? That's right, that's right. So, so scalability comes in, in uh, multiple dimensions, but a good and simple way to think about it, when a radio makes noise, it makes the noise at a certain power, and when the radio attempts to receive something, it attempts to receive it at a certain sensitivity le level. The, um, the lower the incoming signal that you're able to receive, if you have a far away receiver, the more sensitive it, it needs to be. And that difference between the radio transmitting power and the radio sensitivity is the amount that we need to uh, cancel the interfering signal. And um, today we are able to do that for uh, commercial uh, LTE networks transmitting at about uh, 20, 20 watts. Um, in, in the military, in some environment, they're obviously using uh, higher power systems. We think we can scale up to, uh, to that level, 50 watts, maybe more. Um, and in terms of uh, sensitivity, 
we are able to uh, to hit very close to the uh, to the noise floor uh, the sensitivity of, of the radio so we're we're trying to impact very minimally that uh, that sensitivity of the radio which is a very uh, you know precious um, um, th th this is the most important aspect of the of the radio when it attempts to receive signals. So we're trying not to hurt that. Um, and and obviously for for you and me in the civilian world, it's just an inconvenience. Whereas uh, for somebody in the military world, that's a life or could be a life or death situation. Talk to us about the power bands. I mean, for example, you know, Navy radars, the Aegis system, uh, enormous power. Um, I think it's about three point five gigawatt uh, on on the on the spectrum. Um, you know, t talk to us about how this applies to very large, higher power systems, and how it applies to actually smaller systems. For example, systems, for example, that may be on a fifth-generation fighter aircraft. Uh, right. So, wh why don't we start from the uh, naval radar systems? Um, the um, today, the civilian world, for example, is trying to use the uh, the so-called CBRS spectrum, the 3.5 gigahertz spectrum which is used uh, for uh, naval radar uh, by, uh, by the military. Um, the, the concept is to put uh, sensors uh, around the, uh, the seashores and uh, other places where uh, naval radio radars may be used, try to detect them, try to inform a database that in those areas at a given moment a naval radar is operating, and as such the civilian world should not be using those, uh, those CBRS systems in that location or that particular frequency on which the radar is operating. So with our, uh, with our technology, you can avoid all this hassle altogether. If you can uh, transmit and at the same time listen to incoming signals, you could detect that a, ra a radar is transmitting in the area and you can stop transmitting and move on to a different, um, to a different frequency. So that's, for example, a way to, um, to address the interference issues between the civilian CB, uh, CBRS uh, radios and the, uh, the naval ships without uh, touching the high power of the, uh, the radar, um, which, which at the moment is a, is a very challenging uh, aspect. Uh, and, then what and what about combat aircraft, for example? Right, right. So, so today every pilot uh, knows that he has a box. He may not know what the box does, but he knows that he has a box in the aircraft called um, Interference Blanker Unit, IBU. Uh, and, the, and the purpose of the Interference Blanker Unit is to uh, coordinate between the different uh, systems in the airplane to make sure that they're not interfering with each other. It's not that the system knows how to solve the interference problem between the different systems. It, what it does know is to timeshare the, the system. So the, uh, the radar and the, and the comm system and uh, whether it needs anti-missile systems, they're all systems that are using radar technology. And the, uh, the IBU is basically allocating time uh, slots to, uh, to each one of the units. The, a unit that needs to transmit is signaling that IBU that it needs the, the, uh, the air time, and that IBU is basically informing the rest of the subsystems in the aircraft to uh, hold on. And that's, a, you know, in a, in a time-critical environment like a jet fighter, that could be a problem. And again, our system basically cancels the local interference. So when you have two systems that are trying to operate at the same time, one is trying to transmit, the other is trying to receive, with our system in the, in the middle, that can happen. As of today, it cannot happen. Uh, so talk to us what's, what's next for the company, right? You're 35 uh, guys. Uh, you uh, guys are not uh, putting uh, revenue uh, numbers out there, but you're saying that your income is, is more than 1 million, less than 10 million, so that gives people a bread box. Uh, idea uh, of, of size a little bit. Talk to us about what your growth strategy is. Who are you going to partner with? What are the products and systems that we're going to see uh, your technology on? Is this something that you guys license? Is it that you sell? Talk to us about what the growth strategy for the company is. Sure. So today the technology is packaged in a module and that module is uh, relatively small, about uh, four by four uh, inches. 
It's relatively small for a military system. It's relatively large for a mobile phone or a Wi-Fi access point uh, or an IoT device. So as a next step, uh, next year we will release a, a chip. Uh, just last week we, uh, we taped a, a test chip on the way to, uh, to that ultimate commercial chip. A, and that chip will pack the functionality of that four by four board and, and much more. And that chip, if you uh, place it uh, in front on, as, as the front end of a radio, will allow, to, uh, allow the, the solution to suppress the, uh, the noise that the transmitter makes and allowing a receiver to operate uh, on that frequency, on adjacent frequency. And um, that chip will, be, uh, will allow us to go after the, uh, the Wi-Fi environment, which is uh, obviously uh, hundreds of, uh, of millions of, uh, of units a year. The same with the, uh, with the IoT uh, sensor infrastructure. Uh, and, and markets like that. So, so we are very much committed to the commercial market. The, uh, the military market is an early adopter of, uh, of our technology, and we are already leveraging what uh, we have developed in, uh, in military projects. And, and what is the, the size of this market uh, in, a, in a ballpark uh, measure, right? Um, and, and who else is in it that you're competing for, right? Because there are guys who do, who do have their own technologies and way that, ways to handle this. Uh, you know, a number of countries uh, have focused on uh, being able uh, to do this. Generally, you know, sophisticated defense nations uh, tend to focus more on this. What, what's the size of this market, whether for the, the new product, but also in the retrofit market? Yeah, maybe first in terms of, uh, of competition, uh, for good and bad, there isn't really a competition in, uh, in the market uh, today. We have a very uh, unique technology. There are alternatives, uh, but not uh, exactly uh, you know, a, a competition that is, uh, is up to par to what we are doing. Uh, there are alternatives. For example, uh, people are separating uh, antennas. Uh, people are putting very heavy shielding. Uh, between, uh, between radios. But all of these things have uh, limitations and costs that we are, uh, we are trying to, uh, to avoid. In terms, of the, uh, in terms of the size of the market, um, so, so the idea is to develop the technology in a smaller and smaller and smaller package with the ultimate goal to get it into uh, 5G, 6G uh, mobile devices. And these are, uh, these are billions of devices. A, a good way to think about the, uh, the value that we bring is look at how much the commercial world is paying for spectrum. Uh, right? in, in recent auctions, uh, Verizon and AT&T and, and other such companies have paid billions of dollars in order to acquire a spectrum. And if you think about what our technology does, it at a minimum, double the utilization of that spectrum asset. And that's how you can think about the, uh, the potential, the commercial potential, the financial potential, potential for the company.